on behalf of the Biochemical Society and Portland Press, I'm really pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, which is part of our biochemistry focus webinar series. Topics in this series include different research areas in the molecular biosciences, as well as practical sessions to support career development. Uh, each webinar will give you the opportunity to ask questions via text, and we always welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers uh, in the webinar series. Please see our website for more details. My name is Vicky Higman. I'm a structural biologist working at the University of Leicester, and I'm part of CCPN, the Collaborative Computational Project for NMR. I'm also a member of the Biochemical Society Research Area Panel on Molecular Structure and Function, and it's in this capacity that I'm chairing today's webinar. In this webinar, we're going to be celebrating the 60th anniversary of the Colworth Medal, kindly sponsored by Unilever. The Colworth Medal is a prestigious annual award which is presented to uh, outstanding research by an early career biochemist of any nationality who's carried out the majority of their work in the UK or in the Republic of Ireland. And in this series now, we are bringing together some of our past winners from across the decades to discuss their careers, their achievements, and perhaps offer some advice. And today I'm really delighted to be joined by Professor Sir Philip Cohen, Professor Sheena Radford OBE, Professor Dario Alessi OBE, and Professor Mark Dillingham. Before we start with the introductions though, I'd just like to remind everyone that questions are encouraged throughout the webinar and we'll be asking them at the end of the discussions. Please just type your questions into the box as shown in the image on the screen and then we'll try to answer as many as we can um, within the time we have. So I'd like to ask our uh, panelists to introduce themselves briefly. Um, perhaps we'll do this in order in which you received uh, your medals. So um, Philip, could you perhaps start us off, please? Yes, I'm, I'm Philip Cohen. Um, I'm the professor of enzymology at the University of Dundee. Um, and I've been a principal investigator there for almost exactly 52 years now. Thank you. Sheena. Hello, everybody. I'm Professor Sheena Radford. I'm a structural biologist and professor of structural molecular biology and ASPE professor of biophysics at the University of Leeds. And I've also been in one place for a long time. So I've been in Leeds since 1995, enjoying great science the whole time. Thank you. Uh, Dario. Uh, thank you. I'm Dario. I'm currently the uh, director of the MRC protein phosphorylation unit and phosphorylation and ubiquitylation unit at the University of Dundee. And I, I've been here since 1991 when I joined Philips Lab as a, as a postdoc at the age of 23, I remember I came and uh, I, I, that's 33 years ago, and uh, yeah, I've, I've been here ever since, and I've had a good time doing uh, working on signal transducts and pathways. Thank you. And finally, Mark. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Professor Mark Dillingham. I'm at the University of Bristol, and I use techniques in uh, biochemistry, biophysics, and structural biology to study protein DNA interactions, and often in the realm of DNA repair pathways. Super, thank you very much. Okay, what we're going to start off with today then is um, asking each of you to perhaps just talk you, us through your career pathway, um, what it, what, how it was that you have ended up in uh, where you are today working on, on the things that you are working on. Um, so perhaps we'll, we'll start off again with uh, Philip. Okay, I, I thought, uh, as I saw that, what happened after the Colworth Medal is, is coming up later. So I'll, I'll just take you briefly up to the year that I got the Colworth Medal, which is 46 years ago now in 1977. Right, so I guess I was the 15th Colworth Medal winner. Um, so I, I carried out my um, BSc and PhD in biochemistry at University College London over the period 1963 to 69. Um, around the end of my PhD, uh, this is when the allosteric theory of enzyme regulation 
was proposed by Jean-Jean Mono and, uh, uh, and Jacob in uh, at the Institut Pasteur in Paris. And I got sort of very excited about that as an undergraduate. And that's why I, I stayed on at UCL uh, to uh, work in this area with um, Michael Rosemar, uh, who's now age 91. Um, uh, he, uh, he's still around. Um, I actually talk to him at the moment about every two or three weeks on the phone as he's not terribly well. Uh, but anyway, um, I, so, um, so after my PhD, I then joined uh, uh, Edmund Fisher's lab at the University of Washington in Seattle. And the reason I did that was that I had gone as a first year PhD student to a protein chemistry summer school in Venice. And there I had met uh, Eddie Fisher and heard him give three lectures. So that was, uh, uh, and I thought he was working, it was the first time I'd really sort of um, learned a lot about uh, covalent as, a, as opposed to non-covalent regulation of enzyme activity. So that's why I went to work there. And then, um, you know, I was only a two-year postdoc, um, three-year PhD and a three-year BSc. So uh, when I was about 25, uh, after about one year in Seattle, I started applying for jobs back in the UK. I had a few possibilities and I, I decided to accept an offer uh, at the University of Dundee. Um, uh, the person who offered me the job is Pete, was Peter Garland, the sixth Colworth Medal winner in 1968. Uh, everyone told me I was writing off my career, that Dundee was in the middle of nowhere, and uh, that would be the end of me. But, uh, you know, I had noticed that um, Peter was a, a really up-and-coming biochemist. Uh, he, he had moved or was just about to move to the University of Dundee from the University of Bristol, where he was a reader. And also he had a big new, brand new building and a number of positions to fill. So to me, it seemed like a, an exciting opportunity to get in at the ground floor. And so I, I went there um, and it seems to have worked out reasonably well after that. Um, and um, I, I got the Colworth Medal six years after that. Um, uh, and there's possibly a number of reasons for that, but um, I put a lot of it down to a single authored paper I published, which is the first paper I published well when I was, uh, after I had become a lecturer at Dundee. And I always recommend young principal investigators to start their careers with a single authored paper. In fact, my student John Rouse uh, did this, um, took my advice and published a single authored paper when he became a PI at Dundee. And there you are, he got the Colworth Medal soon after as well. Yeah. Anyway, uh, what happened after that we can discuss later. Super, thank you very much. Um, Sheila, what, uh, how did you end up in Leeds? Well, it's like beat that, isn't it? Well, I can say, Phil, that I have never published a single author paper. So maybe that says something about my science, or maybe it says that you can also be successful even without that single author paper. Or maybe I should try harder. Anyway, I read Back into the lab for a single author paper. <laughs> I um I read biochemistry at the University of Birmingham for my undergrad. Uh, in the early 1980s and I chose biochemistry because I loved organic chemistry but I didn't really like the rest of chemistry very much and I was very interested in, in the molecules of life and how chemistry worked in a biological setting and I had a fantastic time there and, and when I was there I remember a eureka moment was when Fred Sanger came to give a talk and he talked about pro sequencing proteins and sequencing DNA and I just thought how marvelous these molecules were. I didn't understand really what a protein was at the time, but I really fell in love with proteins and protein function. 
Then I went to Cambridge Biochemistry and I did my PhD there with Professor Richard Perham. And that was a, a great time. I um, was a mechanistic enzymologist working on parabrate dehydrogenase and metabolism. And I was um, admitted to St. John's College and it was just the second year after John's had admitted women into college. So it was a very interesting time where there was a lot of change happening. It was a big change for me moving from uh, a girl group in Manchester to a University of Birmingham to then St. John's College, Cambridge. When I was doing my enzymology for my PhD, I realized that I wasn't quite so interested in where the proton donor was and how all the electrons moved. What I was really interested in is that the lid closed down on the protein and that our story happened and things changed shapes and proteins came together to make new complexes. So I was more interested in proteins on the move. So I got my PhD and published some papers and then I decided because I was interested in proteins on the move, I was very interested in trying to use NMR spectroscopy, which at the time was really just developing to being um, a technique that biochemists could use, not just organic chemists. And so I went to Oxford, to the Oxford Centre of Molecular Sciences, and I worked with uh, Chris Dobson and Gordon Lowe, I started Gordon Lowe in organic chemistry, and then I bumped into Chris Dobson in a seminar. And Chris was telling me about how these proteins folded, and I became utterly interested in the dynamics of proteins when they fold from their unfolded chain to these structures that crystallographers were solving and they, they were functional. So I had a Royal Society University Research Fellowship and I stayed in Oxford for nine years. And um, just as I was leaving um, Oxford to take up my first lectureship position at the University of Leeds was the year I won the Coleworth Medal. And it was a fantastic uh, time for that to happen. Um, it really gave me a lovely thank you and goodbye to Oxford. It gave me a huge hug and a welcome to the University um, of Leeds. And I think I was the first female to receive the Coleworth Medal in its 33rd year. And I hope that that's inspired lots of people that have won the Coleworth Medal since and hopefully more in the years to come. And it's been great ever since. So that's me. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, Dario, you've already mentioned that you um, have been uh, in Dundee for a very long time, but perhaps you can tell us about yeah. some of those earlier years and... Um, sure, how, sure, maybe I could you... even start, you know, my journey to Dundee was, you know, I wasn't very academic at school and the only, I really wanted to do medicine at university, but I never got the marks to do this, so I, the, the things I was least bad at was biochemistry, and, and there was a biology and chemistry, and then someone told me you could do biochemistry. So I was lucky enough to get to Birmingham University. This, this, as, as Sheena did, that was a it was a fantastic university, I have to say. The lecturers there were really went beyond the call of duty to uh, interest us in, in, in science and provide opportunities for experiments when we undergraduates. I worry these days that we're not providing the the current generation for various reasons the same you know wonderful environment that we had when we were undergraduates and uh, yeah, I think I really wanted to go and work in a company when I finished but I, I didn't get many job offers and then I sort of uh, you know I applied for a few PhDs and I didn't get them but then just fortunately I met David Trentham who worked in the National Institute of Medical Research in London and and my and Ian Trail in Dundee in, in Birmingham and they managed between them to get a, to get me a, a studentship. So I, I ended up doing a PhD. It was mainly doing chemistry rather than biology, but there were some biological studies at the end. And and then I uh, yeah I was offered a, a position that I accepted in Mill Hill National Institute of Medical Research of Jim Smith to to work on 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 activins. These are TGF beta family members that regulate development in, in, in those and uh, so I accepted that position now I, I seem quite you know but now I had a panic attack after that because I couldn't I'm, I'm quite clumsy with my hands and I couldn't see myself you know dissecting embryos and looking at development and describing all the developmental stages and uh, you know I just thought I was more of a chemist or a biochemist and I still want to do something medically relevant so I, I thought, I mean, what's the, and then also living in London was 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 very hard at the time. It still is now, 
because of the cost of living. So, uh, you know, in a way, I thought, what's the opposite of London? And and, and I, I had actually read Philip Cohen's book on metabolism when I was an undergraduate. That was on myself, and uh, you, you know, I was impressed with this book, and so. I, I decided to give Philip, a, I wrote Philip a letter and the next day he phoned me up and invited me that weekend to Dundee and took me around to, it's my, still my only round of golf in my life when I came for my interview. Uh, and I'm, I'm and wearing, uh, you know, the life <laughs> membership of the Isle of Harris Golf Club while I'm talking here. Yes, yeah. And um, yeah, no, no. And then I, you know, obviously I really enjoyed working with uh, you know, Philip on protein phosphatases mainly at the beginning and then start, started working on kinases. And um, yeah, I really, you know, got very interested in understanding how how, how, how signal pathways are organized, how the signal moves down the pathway to elicit a physiological effect. And for me, the most exciting thing was that, you know, diseases that disrupt these pathways, you know, uh, if you can understand the disruption of these highways of communication, you can maybe work with drug companies and clinicians to develop improved uh, therapies and diagnosis. And, you know, that's what I basically spent my entire career so far doing. And it's been uh, more or less fun in the, every day, every day. So when were you in Birmingham then, Dario? I didn't realize I you were in there. In 85, I started my PhD, my undergraduate ah. course. And then right, I did. That's the, year, that's the year after I left. And I should say, Ian Trey was my big inspirer too. So he gets two, he was, two ticks. Was, Ian Trey, <laughs> well, if it wasn't for him, because I was doing I was doing a practical, and he I was telling I was applying for, for jobs and companies, but not getting any offers. And he says, well, why don't you consider doing a PhD? And then he told, I had no idea what a PhD was, so he explained it to me. <laughs> and... Uh, you, you know, and then he told me to apply to some. I applied. I didn't get. I didn't get offered the positions. But then he, 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 and David Trentham between them got me the studentship. And but you, but you should have. You should have got those positions because you had won the Perry Prize. So uh, I, I guess you were both. I guess Sam Perry was the head of biochemistry for both of you at the time you were there. Um, became a good friend well, no, of mine. In fact, well, Sam, person... Sam Perry was terribly upset with me because I didn't accept his lectureship at Birmingham and I went to Dundee instead. Yes, no. Well, the, the person I was, I, I'm sure she won't mind me saying who it was, it was Tracy Palmer. She's a, you know, she's a fellow of the Royal Society now. So she got the position rather than me. And I, I, I think, I think uh, Steve Busby made the right choice, you know, you know she, she was the better <laughs> student and, uh, and she did it fantastically well, so it worked out well in the end, I think. So I'm very, I'm very grateful. Great, thank you. Um, and Mark, can you tell us a little bit about uh, sure. your career? Um, sure, so I, I, uh, I read biochemistry in, in Bristol in the mid 90s. Um, in fact, I had uh, my tutorials in the um, office, which is currently opposite mine. I was very heavily influenced by my tutor at the time, who was uh, Steve Halford, who sadly died last year, actually. So keep an eye out. Mark Shelkin and I are going to be writing a, a biographical memoir for Steve, actually. So keep an eye out for that in the not too distant future. Um, I think I've joked before when I've been interviewed to do with the Coldworth thing that I didn't really have any chance to do anything except for DNA protein interactions because Steve was my tutor. and. He didn't really bother to cover, cover any of the rest of the course. He just used to tell me about his own research. And fortunately, I guess I was kind of interested in molecular genetics and restriction enzymes and recombinases and all the stuff that he worked on. I got, I got really interested in, in, in proteins that acted on DNA, especially, especially proteins that did kind of grand scale conformational changes and did cool, cool stuff to DNA, swapping bits of DNA around, moving on DNA. So because of that, I ended up doing my PhD in Oxford with Dale Wigley. I was very lucky to get onto a project where they, they had just solved the first ever crystal structure of any DNA helicase. I got on that project at a brilliant time. It turned out to be a super tractable system and we were able to do a lot of new structural biology and biophysics to look at translocation mechanisms in DNA helicases. Although during, yeah, during my PhD, although we'd made some good progress with understanding underlying mechanisms of helicases, it, it became apparent that there were just tons of these proteins and they often function as modular components in much larger assemblies. 
So I wanted to go and try and understand how they you could slot these little machines into bigger assemblies and do really complicated reactions on DNA. I'd become aware of uh, the work of Steve Kowalczykowski in, in UC Davis uh, in California. He was working on a system called RecBCD, which is one of these very complicated big enzymes with lots of multiple different catalytic subunits doing different weird and wonderful things uh, that functioned in DNA break repair. And he'd also, his lab had also just pioneered the first single molecule observations of DNA helicases on DNA. So I was very excited to go there. I managed to get a welcome one of those welcome traveling fellowships that they used to have. Went there for a few years, worked on those systems, brought back some ideas with me where I followed up doing kinetics on the systems with Martin Webb at the NIMR. So like Dario, I spent some time at the NIMR. Also interacted a lot with David Trentham during, during my time working with Martin Webb on kinetics of helicases. And that set me up eventually to get a URF like Sheena, um, which, I, so I started in Bristol on a URF in at the Royal Society in 2005, and then yeah, shortly afterwards uh, was lucky enough to win the Colworth Medal. Great. Well, thank you very much, all of you. I was uh, next going to ask you to tell me a little bit about um, what it was that sort of inspired you and um, to, to pursue a career in the biosciences and whether we're particular teachers or mentors or, or ex experiences and topics that had sort of, you know, caught your imagination. Um, Dario and Sheena, you've already um, told us a little bit about that. I don't know if you want to add anything more, Sheena. Um, I think only that I never really decided to pursue a career in anything. I just sort of did what inspired me and what I liked doing and one thing led to the next. And often so when I'm talking to um, early career researchers, how did you decide you did this? And someone well, I never did, you know, I just did something I enjoyed. I obviously tried to do it really well and publish it. And 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 I think one thing led to another. I've never really made a career choice in my life. It's been a kind of continual evolution. And so I suppose the one thing that did always inspire me was how proteins are structured, how they fold, how they work and, and now we work on how proteins misfold and cause misfolding diseases and how proteins fold in, into membranes but the eureka moment was seeing my first protein structure the career decision was non-existent <laughs> thank you um philip how about you um well, why did i do biochemistry well i was i was pretty good at chemistry at school we had a wonderful German chemistry mistress called Gertrude Stranz. And, um, but I actually didn't want to become a chemist because my father was a chemist. You know, he invented the ink that the first Sunday Times color supplement was, uh, was printed from. So that was his main claim to fame. And then I, I sort of, you know, I was very always passionate about natural history and I did a lot of bird watching and and I heard about biochemistry and somehow thought it must be a cross between chemistry and bird watching. And <laughs> uh, that's why I uh, that's why I started it. Um, and it didn't turn out like that at all. In fact, I hated the first couple of years as an undergraduate. But it was it was in the third year, just doing a three week practical research project for the first time is what suddenly made me realize that this is this was really exciting and that's what I wanted to do. So that and then I stayed on with the guy I did the undergraduate practical project with Mike Rosemeyer, as I've mentioned before. And uh, you know, as Sheena has said, one thing leads to another. I wanted to get involved then in a more complicated system of regulation and, and phosphorylation fitted the bill. And so I I sort of naturally went to to Ed Fisher and learned how you study this process. Uh, in those days, it was thought to be a very specialized process confined to the regulation of one enzyme. But of course, as it turned out, it, it turned out to regulate almost all, um, you know, intracellular processes, which is why Eddie Fisher got the Nobel Prize uh, in 1992, 21 years after I left as a postdoc. That was for his discovery back in 1955. So he had to wait till 37 years before he got the Nobel Prize. But 
had to wait until it was really clear it was a general control mechanism and not something just confined to the regulation of glycogen metabolism. Thank you. Mark, you already mentioned your tutor having a big uh, impact on you. Was there anything yeah. else that... Uh... Um, <clears throat> well, I, th I suppose going back to what why I got interested in biochemistry, I, I think there were two really formative things. One, I, I, classic thing, I had an I had a really good chemistry teacher, Norman Council. I remember him well uh, from my school. If you're listening, Norman, good stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, he was he was super enthusiastic, and he, I think he'd had a weird route into teaching. I think he worked in in chemistry industry and then gone back into teaching. And one had the impression that he was really knowledgeable and just he he was just a great teacher. He just sort of inspired me to want to do chemistry, and I think also helped me to get reasonably good at chemistry. But the reason I got into, um, you know, the, the molecules of life or what have you was uh, I, I just was completely amazed by recombinant DNA technology. I remember hearing about recombinant production of insulin in, in bugs. And I just thought it's, I just felt it was insane that you could trick a life form into making this really useful protein for you just by sticking a bit of DNA in it you know, with this magical code that would do it all for you. And so that, uh, I think I always had an interest in sort of central dogma processes because of that. Like I say, Steve very much reinforced that for me because of his love of DNA as well. Um, I got, I suppose the other, the other formative moments I can remember are while I was in, while I was an undergraduate, the, the F180 PA structure was published from John Walker at the LMB. And um, I, I, I'd always been, I always thought enzymes might all be a bit boring. Like at Sheena, I think I thought maybe pyruvate dehydrogenase was a bit boring, but then there was what? this kind of enzyme that was, that was actually a machine, you know, that moved and transduced energy from ATP into conformational changes. And, and, um, and then shortly after I heard about that from Leo Brady, who taught us structural biology, I, I, I had a, a Steve West, now at the Crick gave a lecture on the Rave B complex and he was talking about helicases and what, how much we didn't know about how they worked. And it seemed to bring together my, <clears throat> my love of DNA and this idea of, of enzymes being machines. And that's, I guess, how I got into helicases. Yeah. And, and I haven't yet disclosed, by the way, that like Sheena, I also did my PhD on dehydrogenases. Ah, right, oh. so I shouldn't have. My case, I, glucose, I don't really think it's glucose possibly <laughs> hydrogenase the first enzyme of the pentose phosphate pathway yeah well, i think it's also interesting how we all we'll see if dario is the exception we all started with chemistry because my dad was a chemist and my grandfather and so for me the inspiration was uh, was genetic i think from birth we're always asking why is the grass green and why is the sky blue and how does the brain work and um, that was a topic of conversation often when doing the dishes after dinner. So Dario, was it chemistry that inspired you or did you start with a different route? I think you're muted at the moment. You've got muted now, uh, Dario. Yeah, I, I guess, I, I guess it, my, well, my, my family were all farmers, soldiers or administrators. There wasn't a single scientist to my knowledge anywhere you know behind before me so i was quite everyone was a bit straight it was a bit puzzled when i went into doing something scientific but um yeah for me i think it was more ha having a problem i could understand because i think a lot of the time it's you know there's lots of problems and like structural biology i mean it was too complicated for me to understand the mathematics or nmr and you, you know I, I preferred to get my hands into a problem that was conceptually quite straightforward to understand but then yet a, a very big challenge and that the answer you know might be useful so uh so that's what i quite liked about science there was a there was a, a clear-cut problem uh, you, that you had to try and solve one way or the other and uh i think that's what's motivated motivated me a lot especially at the beginning was just that being able to do curiosity-driven research, just to do something that's enjoyable, interesting. You know, you, you have to think about it when you go home at night and, and analyze your data and in the morning work out out of the hundred experiments you think you could do, which one are you going to do and why? And then you, 
you know, and when things don't work, then you have to be strong enough to persevere and, uh, you know, and, and not give up. And I think that's, uh, yeah, no, that's one of these, um, but I quite enjoy that. Yeah. So uh, that, that's what drove me a lot, I think. Yeah, and you can get paid to do it. In a way, you're getting, you're getting a, a, it's like a vocation, you're getting paid to do your hobby. I, I still think that, <laughs> you know, uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's quite surprising, yeah. Um, are there any particular aspects that you feel really helped and, and supported you in the success you've had in your work? Any particular, um, not just mentors and collaborators, we've talked about that a bit already, but sort of support networks, um, experiences? Um, what, what, what was it that enabled you to, to win the Colworth Medal, I guess? Um, I don't, Mark, do you want to start us off? Um, yeah, I mean, well, I'd, I'd made some notes. I, I, I very much think science is a lot about teamwork. So just is, I don't. I also don't have a single author paper, Philip. It'd, it'd be good if I did, but certainly I've, I've benefited massively from the teams I've worked in. I don't think I could have achieved, you know, half of what I've done without some of the brilliant people I've worked with. Both, both when I was a student and a postdoc, I was lucky to work in some brilliant teams. Uh, people bring in different ideas and different techniques to the table, and also, you know, as a, what I've achieved as a PI, I certainly couldn't have done without having been lucky enough to have some fabulous people in the lab. So, and it's not just it's not just that immediate research team, is it? It's also your your peers in in your department who can help to critique your work and and give you support, and also I you know your wider field. So, um, I guess I'm a lot in the sort of DNA repair. DNA protein interactions field, and they've always been very friendly and supportive environments to work in more widely. So I feel like uh, my answer to the question is that, that I've been lucky to be in some really brilliant teams and work with great people. Thanks. Um, I, have, I, I don't, don't want it to appear that I'm a complete loner and I've done everything by myself. I, uh, I've had some, uh, some very great collaborations, but the collaborations have involved really, you know, two different parties with complementary skills suddenly impinging unexpectedly on on the same problem. So I'm thinking particularly of, you know, five, eight year collaborations with, that I had with people like Chris Marshall and Michelle Godert uh, throughout, for example, the 1990s. <laughs> yeah. So 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 yes, no collaboration is very important, but I I think. We all agree that I think that passion for your research is very important because uh, without the passion, you actually won't be able to go through the huge amount of uh, uh, of work and perseverance that's necessary in order to crack, you know, a difficult problem. So uh, it's important, you know, not to give up, even when it looks like things are almost completely impossible and that applies actually to non-scientific uh, well or semi-scientific uh, uh, um, things that I've done uh, so for example uh, uh, you know in the, in the in the mid 1990s I you know I was lucky enough to um, be asked by a couple of pharmaceutical companies to uh, to help them characterize what turned out to be the first really potent and specific inhibitors of uh, of uh, serine threonine specific protein kinases and that convinced me that i you know i was far from convinced that any of these compounds uh, would turn out to be drugs to treat diseases but what i was convinced about was that they were going to be fantastically good reagents for help to help me work out how cell signaling pathways work. So it took me about 30 seconds to decide that I had to have, you know, have a huge collaboration with the pharma industry to, to get enough of these molecules to, uh, to help my research. And it took, uh, but it turned out I was very naive about pharma and it took, you know, several years to persuade, you know, five major pharmaceutical companies to all work together with me <laughs> and uh, you know to try and develop these compounds to uh, that I could use as reagents and that, that they could try and make 
turn into drugs. Um, uh, one, there was a whole year spent trying to get the lawyers of these five companies trying to sign a single agreement. You know, every time I thought we were nearly there, what happened was that the um, uh, every I mean, every time I I thought we were really going to get there, they said, well, let's let our lawyers have one more look. And if a lawyer is asked to take a look, their job is to find faults with everything. Finally, I, you know, I really thought I was going to have to give up, but I called one last meeting of the five senior lawyers of each company and booked a room at Heathrow Airport and everyone flew in for the meeting and I melodramatically locked the door and said, if we don't solve this in the next two hours, I'm, 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 this is all, all up the spout. But anyway, finally it succeeded and by some miracle, it's uh, it's actually still running today. The, the you know the longest uh, ever running collaboration between pharma pharmaceutical companies and academia. I think we uh, we have to celebrate its silver anniversary this year. Of course, Dario is now mm -hmm. running it, so <laughs> I just have the fun of of sitting in a, in on these things. He has to do all the hard work and. Uh, such as organizing the 25th uh, birthday party for this collaboration. Well, so Dario, do you want to tell us a little bit about just what you're doing? reminded me about something I haven't yet started doing. <laughs> I'd like to, I keep, <laughs> this is my yes. main role, sort of jogging you know, your I think that, um, I think there's always a fine line between success and failure. And for me, obviously, I, you know, the mentors have been extremely important, but I've always just talked to everybody every day about our results, what's going on, and uh, there's lots of sort of non-tangible tangible benefits from doing this. And yeah, one example, I remember just talking to my colleague Graham Hardy, you know, over, you know not even over coffee, just we we're just chatting. Maybe it was over coffee actually, and uh, you know, in between our conversation, we suddenly realised that one of the kinases I was working on called LKB1. Could be the he spent 20 years trying to look for the upstream activator of AMP kinase, that, you know, which is an enzyme involved in uh, regulating energy levels, in the, and uh, and and we just realised that maybe the LKB1 could be from talking, you know, could be the upstream regulator, and the, we, and the next day we did an experiment and it turned out to be the case, and, and the rest is is history. I mean, that was sort of a eureka moment essentially, but. That came from just a little chat in, in, in the coffee room, just uh, without mm. the, without that little discussion, we would still, well, someone else would have discovered it by now, but it was, uh, yeah, so, so I'm, my recommendation is always talk about your results. Don't keep anything secret. You'll win 99% of the time. Okay, maybe 1% of the time, you, you know, uh, your competitor will scoop you maybe or accelerate their work. But if you think about it, if you if you if you win 99% of the time, that's not bad, and you you're going to have a better career and make more solve more problems by doing that. And uh, I think more, people are becoming more open and discussing data much more than they did in the past, which is great. I still think there's a way to go. And if there's any young people in the audience listening, you know, my recommendation is don't keep any secrets. Just always talk about your work seek help seek see seek advice and uh, you know you you get some good ideas to uh, solve the problems that you're working on thanks you know do you want to add anything thank you yeah i think the common theme here for all of us and i i was, was laughing when mark gave his answer so my top one was team working and i think you can think about what you mean by team and for me, I've always had a fantastic research group who work with me. We're great friends as well as great colleagues. Um, but I've always had, you know, enjoyed working with in a multidisciplinary team where you might be really stuck on an idea and you bump into a chemist or a physicist or a medic or whoever they might be, a biologist. And they say, well, it's obvious in my field. This is what's happening. So that's I've always really enjoyed. And the, the bumping in to people in the tea room is, is critical. Um, for science and, and in the Aspie Centre in Leeds, which I was a founding member of when I first got there and I was director for 
nine years. I've just stepped down as, as being the director. We built a fantastic supportive environment. It's sort of the better together environment. Tell everybody, I'm agree with Dario, you should tell everybody everything because somebody's more likely to give you a great idea than they are to steal your idea. And uh, I think when we go to conferences, but another one is about conferences because I think I've also had the joy and I think it's a bit different in different fields, but in the kind of protein folding structure function field, it's a hugely supportive field. And I've got friend, lifelong friends now who I met at a meeting and you're saying, how's it going, she? And I said, well, on the surface, I should say it's going really well, but deep down I've got this big problem and I don't understand my data and, and then they help you. So that's really cool. That's really exciting one of my great lifelong friends is jane clark who's a professor of chemistry in cambridge and jane um wrote in her um little piece when she retired that her best one of her best friends in science was her biggest competitor sheena radford and we competed like mad if jane did a great experiment i was always happy and envious in equal measure but we supported each other throughout our, throughout our career so make friends with your competitors is also good advice <laughs> uh, no, I, th I think I think we all agree that um, it's, you, you can't do much without a good team of people working for you. So a very important part of success is, is spending a lot of time on recruitment, trying to to get the best people to work with you. Yeah, and then spending time with them to get them to get to know your colleagues and your group of people, yeah. um, so you can all work out how to tick and get the best out of each other. It's definitely better together. Yeah. Great. Any particular obstacles that you have come across, um, ways in which you've overcome them? Um, yes, I've had a, you, you, everybody has had some problem <laughs> over the years. Um, for example, Ed Fisher turned me down three times. It's only the fourth time. I I, I told, asked him to change his mind that he uh, he did so. So a lot of people would have given up before then. So sometimes you have to be very persistent to get round the obstacles. Um, even today, if someone writes to me three uh, three or four times and I because I haven't replied because I'm too busy or because I I don't really have a position, I I think oh this person really wants to work with me. I better have at least a Zoom call with them and, and see whether I. <laughs> Miss, whether I'm missing a, a good opportunity here. Um, oh, my first, when I became a PI, um, my first research grant um, to what was then called the Science Research Council, the, uh, now BBSRC, uh, was turned down. Why was it turned down? Uh, I can still remember the referee's comments. It's uh, just over 50 years ago. So, <laughs> One, one set of comments were the following. Um, oh, um, protein phosphorylation. Yes, that's all solved now. It, Ed Fisher and Ed Krebs have found that glycogen phosphorylase is controlled by reversible phosphorylation. What else is there to discover? And um, the next one was, well, even if it is a good idea, um, how can this young investigator compete with those huge teams of Ed Fisher and Ed Krebs? You know, he's got no chance of competing, so you shouldn't fund this grant application. Uh, this is probably the same sorts of reactions that any young person putting in their first grant might frequently get today in a slightly different context because every subject is different. So um, uh, actually, I didn't apply to the BBSRC again for for the next 50 years. It, in fact, I've, it's only this year I've been awarded for the very first time ever my, a research grant from BBSRC. So, so that's a okay. surprise. Um, um, what else is difficult? Getting your, first else? getting your first research prize is difficult. Much easier to get things after that because if no one's got a research prize, then the jury always look at look at it and they say, why hasn't he got a, a research prize before? It'll be safer and a choice to give it to someone who's already got a prize. So <laughs> this is another potential, you know, 
hurdle to get round once you get to a particular level. Um, and um, and of course to get so this is why actually the Colworth Medal is very useful because it often is your first research prize. <laughs> so you're sort of on the road very young in this sort of way. And then, um, but of course you always need a champion to propose you for awards. I've actually never in my life asked anybody to propose me for any of anything. Um, and I actually get irritated when people ask me to propose mm -hmm. them. But, um, but, 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 you know, for some people, you know, in, you know, who, who, who are in sort of, places where no one ever thinks of putting anybody up, maybe they do need a bit of more help like that and be proactive. I don't know, it's a difficult one. Anyone else want to add anything about particular obstacles that they've had to overcome? I sort of agree with Phil in some respects. I think for me, the biggest obstacle in science is continuously having to raise funding. Um, I, you know, re, you know, especially if you're not in a big unit like at Dundee, and uh, maybe Mark and I were continuously writing three-year, five-year grants to keep going, and it's really tough. You know, it's really tough, and and we all have horrible referees' comments, and we all don't have grants funded, and it's incredibly stressful. And and I think it's really important. That's when the team working comes in, and I think it's really important to show people and that when you don't get a grant funded or you get horrible referees comments on a paper you should share the angst because it is full of ups and downs but my advice would be for every down it's always amazing how an up tends to follow quite quickly even if the up is that experiment that hasn't been working for six months suddenly works and you get that rush of enthusiasm again so i think the advice for me would be life is full of ups and downs we all have personal ups and downs as well as scientific ups and downs and I think those of us that have been successful have probably been lucky enough to have the team working and the support networks that help us ride you know enjoy the ups and also burrow and survive the downs yeah, yeah I, I really agree strongly with Gina I didn't want to be the first one to mention the f word but funding is is one of the <laughs> one of the tougher things and it obviously you get a lot of knockbacks philip already mentioned the importance of passion and the associated resilience that that can give you so i do think it's something that you get need to get used to in science it can be it can be very frustrating obviously if you are unable to get what you consider to be promising lines of inquiry funded so you know there's been times when things have been shut down despite i really genuinely felt we could have done some really nice stuff there and that's been some of the hardest things to take actually um but yes they're, they're hopefully you, you have more good times and bad times and you've got to keep plugging away at it um and the other thing of course everybody needs is luck although we don't <laughs> uh, we don't say that very often but we Sure. As I said, I've, I've never asked, you know, or, you know, anyone for anybody. So I, it was complete luck that we became an MRC unit. I didn't apply for it. I was just going in for what at the time was my third five year program grant renewal. But for some reason, um, Nick Hales, uh, who was then the chair of the Physiological Systems and Disorders Board of the MRC in 1989, decided that my grant, my grant application looked more like a unit. And he's the one who suddenly proposed that, uh, you know, that, that a small unit should be set up under my direction. This turned out to be absolutely marvelous because, you know, my late wife, Tricia, who up till then had had a, uh, an, a, an annual a position renewed every single year by the University of Dundee for 20 years, was able to get her first real full-time job. So I was, you know, I, I direct, was the director of the unit. She was the head of molecular biology. So this was huge luck. But of course, when any luck like that comes along, you have to capitalize on it. Um, for me, the MRC units are absolutely marvelous. Uh, you have rolling five-year support. So 
It allows you to do things that you just can't do on regular research grants. So, um, for example, to change field. I mean, you know, after you know, my lab worked out a major chunk of the insulin signal transduction pathway. Uh, there was still a lot to be done. For, for me, it was no longer a black box, so I just wanted to change field. And I, 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 you know, I got very excited about innate immunity and how 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 it was regulated. And and I basically just changed the fields. I used the similar technologies that I'd used to sort out insulin action to you know to get into innate immunity. But I am absolutely sure that I would not um, have been funded, uh, you know, if I'd not been in a unit. When in a unit, I just did it, you know. Um, and I think I've done reasonably well in this area. Um, uh, but, um, uh, but, you know, now I'm no longer, I mean, I'm based at the MRC unit now, but I'm actually not funded by the unit and I have to get my own research funding. And I've recently proposed to change my research area again because of something I discovered. And I got, you know, referees coming back to me, you know, um, saying, uh, notwithstanding the paper you published last year in the EMBO journal, we really think that your proposals are very exciting, but much too preliminary. Please, uh, you know, go away and get some more preliminary data. Now, uh, this is this is very this is what makes it so wonderful to be in an MRC unit. You just do it, you know, and you stand or fall by your decision. Whereas. Uh, uh, you know, if you're if you're not protected in that way, you probably won't change field. You'll start dotting the I's and crossing the T's of the no, same. I don't, I, I don't think that's actually true for all of those listening. I've never worked in a unit, and there's lots of people that manage to have successful careers. But I think you do have to be nimble-footed. You do have to make your own luck, um, and you do have to change fields to. Um, to, to have the inspiration to do new things. So I think being in with having long term funding, five year grants are, are great. But the most important thing is to have that diff, that idea that's different from the status quo. That's really what you're saying, isn't it? And I think um, and you have to be nimble footed to, to try new things out. And that's why having young people in your labs are really good, because that it's often a new PhD student's not wise enough to tell you that your idea is a bit risky and you can inspire them to, to try new things. And many of the new things we've done have all started from those young researchers coming to your lab to start to start new things off. So I think we're very lucky in the UK in that we have many ways of funding our science through the UKRI and through Wellcome and through charities and cancer charities. So. Um, there's lots of ways of getting research funded, but it's really hard work and it's full of ups and downs. That would be my advice to those listening. Um, I, I, I agree with all, uh, with all of that. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> the fact that there are several different avenues to get grants. So in fact, the, the grant I refer to that was turned down uh, uh, was actually subsequently funded by another, uh, yeah, another research organization. Okay, well, um, thank you very much for, for everything you've been contributing. I think it's probably about time we um, invited the audience to start asking some questions. In fact, we've only got at least one that's um, come in. So for those of you who are watching us, um, do um, uh, if you've got any particular questions, uh, just type it into the box and um, uh, then I can read them out and um, uh, I'll ask those. So we've got our first question here. Um, There's an interesting one. Um, thanks for all the speakers and the host. How do you mentor your postdocs who wish to leave their own group and pursue a new area that is distinct from the one you're currently focused on? I think that's a really interesting question, perhaps for those who think they might one day want to, to win the Colworth Medal. Um, 
Dario, do you have any? Yeah, no, no. So I, I do quite a lot of this. So um, what I always suggest, and I, I do this for, it's actually maybe slightly easier as well to do it for your colleagues, postdocs as well uh, as your own. But what I what I tend to do is, um, you know, maybe I, maybe a year or a year and a half before you, you think you might be ready to be, be start applying for positions. I arrange a monthly or every two monthly meeting with the uh, with the uh, with the postdoc, and we discuss. You know, at the beginning the plans are very vague and not very focused, and I discuss with them what they want to do, and then how how are they going to get there, and I advise them to go and talk to four or five other people that you know might you know be able to provide further support, and and then we have a plan for what they're going to do. And then they come back in in a month or two months' time and, and tell me, you know, who they've talked to and what they've done. And obviously, their their current experimentation in the lab is uh, is obviously very important. And uh, and then we gradually build up confidence and a, a solid research question for them to be strong enough to uh, you, you know to 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 make, put in a strong application for position either in, in, in well, the university or, or or somewhere else and uh, you know I found that to be uh, you know very useful in uh, in doing that I always tell people you know they can take any reagent they want from my lab any any idea any question you know, you know I, I think there's uh, even if two investigators start out in the same sort of field within a, a month or two they'll be working on different Different roads and uh, and and often a the, 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 a young a young person is going to be very you know you know much better at being competitive than uh, than uh, than I would be. But we, we we tend not to compete, obviously. So if if I knew somebody was working in an area they wanted to go on, I've got so many other areas I can work on. I'm very happy just to support yeah. them to, to to work on that. Thank you. Mark, well, is that something? Yeah, you want to think? I think, yeah, I, I, I agree with everything Daria said. I, I also think it's important uh, to encourage your senior PDRAs to be taking on some of the jobs that, that, that they will need to do more when they transition to independence. So help, directly help them with writing grants, reviewing papers, maybe giving them the responsibility to manage a, a younger person in the lab and their research. So think yeah just because obviously one thing that happens between the PDRA to PI stage is you start doing a lot of jobs that you've never done before and you might not be <laughs> that good at to start with especially managing people so yeah I'd add I'd add that to everything Dario said yeah maybe volunteering to give a few lectures as well yeah and yeah absolutely I've got two people in my lab who've actually now got some sort of uh certificate for giving undergraduate lectures and so when they go for an interview at another university someone in the panel might ask them beyond their research have you got any teaching experience and if you can say you've got this teaching certificate it's going to be a but it's going to be a plus in the interview i think yeah and a quick one for me, I think another thing we can do, so two very quick things. One is I think mentoring our, our group to be successful in whatever they do next in the career is a really important responsibility that we all have in our teams. And, and the other thing I think we can do is help your group to make contact with other people that can help them. They might be looking for new collaborations and not know who to talk to. And I think introductions to people um, is one of the ways we can also help a lot. So I often do that. You know, you should talk to so and so at the University of wherever. You know, they'd be a key collaborator in something that you'll need to build this program, which really helps their career as well. So it's important, and we should help as much as we can. Um, I agree with that. Um, I just when when I went to Ed Fisher's lab as a postdoc for two years, for one of those two years, the second one. He went on sabbatical leave to Switzerland, so I had no postdoctoral supervisor, and the lab soon started falling apart. And Ed Fisher's students started coming to me to ask for advice, and 
I realized if I didn't take the technicians in hand who are running things like the analytical ultracentrifuge and the and the now obsolete amino acid analyzer, um, then everything was going to fall apart. And after I'd been doing this for about two or three months, I suddenly realized, you know, I could be a PI. <laughs> it, had, it had never occurred to me in my life before that I, I could actually do the job. And that's actually so. For, so maybe we should all go away for a year and let let a senior postdoc, uh, you know, take over our labs and uh, and come back and keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Well, um, unfortunately, it's time for us to um, have to wrap up. So um, I'd like to thank um, our four speakers very much indeed for sharing their experiences, their wisdom, um, some of their advice uh, with us all. Um, thank you all of you who've attended. Um, you can continue the conversation um, online. You can follow at Biochem Sock and at PP Publishing on well, on Twitter, but I think now it's X, isn't it? Um, the Biochemical Society 2025 Awards are uh, now opening for nominations. So if you can think of someone who could be our next uh, Colworth uh, Medal winner, then um, this is an excellent time to um, be thinking about that and submitting your nominations. Um, we've now got a, a new streamlined nomination process and um, the deadline for the sort of initial nominations is the 1st of November. So that's not uh, only about six weeks away. Um, and both members and non-members uh, of the society um, are able to make nominations. So just have a look at our website to find out more. Um, you can also find out more about our webinar series. You can propose um, your own webinar um, and you can have a look at all previous recordings uh, on our website at www.biochemistry.org slash events and training. Um, so do have a look uh, at the website for upcoming webinars. Um, if you've missed any of the 50 plus um, that we've run as part of this series and you want to watch them again, uh, go to the website um, or our YouTube channel. Um, the recording from today's webinar is also going to be made available for people to watch uh, within the next couple of weeks. Do join us on the 25th of September at two o'clock for our next webinar, which is going to be on green microalgae, the promising cellular factory for a greener future, uh, where our invited speaker will explore the impacts of microalgae on global food security, greenhouse gas emission reductions, and the development of novel therapeutics. Um, sounding very exciting. And then finally, I just want to um, highlight that obviously it's more important than ever to stay connected and engage with our fellow molecular bioscientists. Um, so it's an exciting time to join the Biochemical Society uh, and its community of researchers and specialists to stay connected and take advantage of key benefits that um, includes discounted registrations for um, society courses and meetings, exclusive access to a wide range of grants and bursaries, um, personal online access to two of the journals and more. So just um, have a look at the website to find out more. So thank you once again to everyone and goodbye. <laughs>